Great job. I think she's awesome. Hope you do too. Hey, can we stand together as we start? Just want to open with a word of prayer. And uh, just welcome the Lord as we open the scriptures together. Lord, we thank you for this sacred moment. Lord, we just we open up our hearts to hear from you, Lord. I just pray that you would reveal your heart towards us and through us as a community and each of us individually. Lord, we ask you, Lord God, to show us the prophetic path that you've been weaving for generations, Lord. Thank you that we get to be a part of what you spoke to the Israelites thousands of years ago and even experiencing it now. Lord, we thank you for this season of building that we're in. Lord, help us, Lord God, to engage it, Lord God, with faith and with joy and excitement. Lord, let every work I speak, Lord, be be filtered through your Holy Spirit to each one here, Lord God. Would you real, reveal things that I didn't even plan to, Lord? Would you speak to people specifically? In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, let's go to this really wonderful book in the Old Testament. It's a minor prophet. You've heard us talk a lot about it. We're going to go to Amos chapter 9. And to be honest, I'm standing here, and my mind has been completely blown. Like, sometimes you're like, what should I preach on? And you're trying to find anything and make it work. And I I, I don't say this lightly, but I feel like I really met with God. And this is going to be a message that I carry for the rest of my life. It's really, it, it speaks a lot to who we are as a community. Um, there's a myriad of things that we could do here at Big House. And they would be good and awesome and incredible. And the kingdom would come. Um, the, the place that we need to posture ourselves is, God, what are you specifically asking us to do? Because when we do that thing, we're going to be most efficient in the kingdom. This, is, this, is my, this has been my prayer for a long time. Lord, would you show me where I can be most dangerous in the kingdom? There's a lot of things you can do, but what's the thing that you're going to bring the most, deal the most damage to the enemy? That's what I want you guys doing. If it's to paint, then if it's to paint. If it's to write, if it's right, if it's to teach, then teach. But make sure you're doing something. Yes. If you're not doing anything, start with the kids' ministry and start teaching a class. <laughs> I'm telling you, you will learn more and be more transformed by realizing you've got ten little, little hearts waiting for you to unpack the scriptures. You will grow. I was a youth pastor for six years, and it, it, it helped prepare me for everything that's next. So jump in to what the Lord's calling you to do and be most dangerous in the kingdom, okay? Speaking of really dangerous people in the kingdom, there's an incredible beloved pastor that went to be with the Lord this week, uh, Tim Keller. And um, I just wanted to just take a moment, share one of, one, of, one of the quotes that I had read of him and just say for, for every dramatic headline about a pastor who's, who's fallen, there are thousands of pastors every single day giving their lives to the Lord in faithfulness. And that's the headline I love. And guess what? If, if we, the cancel culture was prevalent in the Bible, then we'd have to cancel the Psalms. We'd have to cancel David. We'd have to cancel Moses. Did you know Moses killed somebody? Guess what? We need to let the redemption of God roll like a river in our hearts. God is going to be redeeming and restoring, and uh, and then also he's going to be raising up a pure and spotless bride, ready. Tim Keller was a great, great pastor, and I'm so grateful for his ministry. I know many of us have been uh, really profoundly impacted by him and his ministry. Those who don't know, he's a, he's a pastor in New York, Redeemer Presbyterian Church, faithful writer and pastor of pastors, and um, I love this quote. He says this. To be loved, but not known, it's comforting, but it's superficial. Think about that. Think about that. To be loved, but no one really knows you. It's comforting, but superficial. To be known, but not loved, is our greatest fear. But to be fully known and truly loved, it's, well, a lot like being loved like God. It's what we need more than anything, to be known and loved. It liberates us from pretense, humbles us out of our self-righteousness, and fortifies us for any difficult life, any difficulty life can throw at us. You know, we get to choose what our community looks like, don't we? It's not up to anybody else. It's, it's up to us. We get to choose to be known and, and to love. 
That's my, that's my deepest desire, that you would come here in this community and, and, and find people that really know you and then experience the fullness of love poured out towards you and the love of the Father. My pastor in Florida, he said this. He said, Matt, you need, you need two things. You need somebody that can know you, K-N-O-W, and you need someone that can N-O you. <laughs> it's also power and accountability in community, isn't there? Yeah. Friends that say, you absolutely cannot wear that shirt with those pants. No, no, no. That, that's, that's terrible. No. You need people that, that can, can really know you and love you and say, hey, I know you. Go do this thing. You got to do this. You got to get there. This is for you. Don't stop. Stop. Stop with the false humility. Get, get up there. Go share this word. Speak that prophetic word. Write this. Do this. To be, have people know you and know you. To be loved and known. These are, these are just incredibly powerful themes as we think about what we're building here. We're in a, we're in a building campaign. Time to build. It's, it's practical needs look like us raising funds to build a building. But spiritually what we're seeing God do is upgrading us in the spirit. He's creating more room so that the lame and the broken can come in and find, find Jesus to be known and to be loved. That's the kind of atmosphere and culture that we want to create. And what we've decided is that our main aim and main focus is going to be that we're going to give, up, give, give just wild attention to the presence of God. Being in his presence, making room for his presence. There's many, many good strategies and good and good good efforts and and they'll work and they're godly what we've found is that something profound happens when we really allow the presence of god to come in an intimate way so i want to unpack that a little bit today um for those who don't know pastor adam got a planned knee surgery he got the jiffy knee so he got his right one done he's going to get his left one done soon he's doing good he's got a lot of swelling um but i want to speak to that real quick for, for those of you young grasshoppers in the faith that might look at Big House and be like, wow, this is, this is easy. You guys just showed up, and people are here, and the presence of God is here. Can I tell you, Adam was bivocational for many years. His knees were bone to bone. Fifteen years, he was bending down, dyeing leather seats and car lots all across Hampton Roads. That's how he made his living. He sacrificed greatly so that a community could be created where we could come and experience the presence of the Lord. He was following the voice of the Lord. People like Jerry Cates, who got Adam to where he's at. Thank you, Jesus. You know, Jerry, Jerry's been doing behind-the-scenes work for many of us for, for decades. So grateful for him. Um, but God's been birthing something and building something for many years, and I'm the beneficiary of that. I got to come in in a season where I could be here full time. And, I, and I, I so value that at the highest level where this community has allowed many of us to be full time, full focused on serving you, uh, making space and, and building for the kingdom. It's an exciting thing, but I'm just seeing there's been, there's been this prophetic roadmap that maybe many of us were even unaware of, but God was behind the scenes opening doors. And I'm excited to unpack this a little bit. Um, I will say, pastorally, helping organize Big House, it's absolutely terrifying. <laughs> Every single week, we just, I'm like, this is going to be the week when no one has a word, the worship team doesn't know what song to sing next, and nobody comes, and I didn't prepare a message well, and like, it's just going to fall flat. But for five years straight, I have shown up and experienced the power and presence of God in an absolutely profound way, over and over and over again. I used to this like I used to stand there just like, like building an ulcer, like, you know, is God gonna? Sh and just now I'm just like, He's just gonna take care of this. I don't have to. The Lord said, I will build my church. If we build it in our own strength, we have to sustain it in our own strength. If He builds it, He sustains it. That's the best way to do ministry, y'all. And I want to thank you guys for responding every week, for coming with passion for the Lord, for being bold and declaring your prophetic words and bringing your songs and having time in the secret place to bring something that's beautiful. That's so powerful and important for us because God is bringing of a harvest. The harvest is what? Plentiful. It's plentiful, but the laborers are few. You guys are the laborers, and God is going to bring in even more of this harvest. I love the story of Casey Capra. Her and her husband, John, started coming a couple years ago. 
and she would just had, I think her second child and was dealing with postpartum, was dealing with depression. They were kind of looking for the right church and they came to Big House and they would just sit quietly. And um, you guys aren't here, are you? Where are you? Hi. <laughs> Casey, love you. And um, she had shared this publicly and then I also reached out to her text, so I'm allowed to say all these things, just been clarified. But uh, she was just in a season and just kind of, kind of wrestling with a, with a dark season. Anybody been in a dark season before and you feel like you can't find your way out? I've been there. I've been there. So she would just sit for two to three months. She said, I would sit there and cry, maybe feel nothing, and just pray. She's talking about the faith and the worship in the room began to lift her. And every single week, it was like, got better and better and better and better. Sometimes saying nothing, sometimes not even being able to sing. Have you been there before? <laughs> Maybe mad or bitter or angry or hurting. But she just, she said, um, it started to lift more and more each Sunday. And that's when she came and shared this word. She's just free. She's completely free, fully released in what God's called her to do. Not, not any. You had another child, right? And worried the same thing was going to happen. And it didn't. Praise God. Yes. So. Did you notice she didn't say, Pastor Matt preached a great message. Somebody prayed for me. There was this certain song that I held on to. She said, you guys in the room worshiping, the atmosphere began to shift her life. That's the presence of the Lord coming and moving. We want to make more space for that. I want to get out of the way. <laughs> I'm not very good anyways. <laughs> you know what I mean? You need to meet with Jesus. You don't need to meet with me. You don't need my wisdom. You need the Lord's wisdom. Thank you, Jesus. So none of this makes sense, you guys. I was at a, a, a golf tournament the other day, and, and somebody said, hey, uh, who are you with? And I said, Big House Church. And he said, I know Big House Church. And I was like, what? Everybody normally was like, what are you guys, a jail ministry, the Big House? Like, I don't, I don't get it. You know, explain things. And it's, it's really kind of interesting that the words getting out about Big House, but I believe that we're not going to be known as Big House Church. We're going to be known as a place where people have been meeting with the Lord, and I'm excited about that. Okay, let's go to uh, Amos chapter nine. Isn't it interesting? Do you ever, do you ever, do you ever feel this feeling of like I just want to stay in the New Testament? It's the New Covenant, and I just want to stay there. And that's like that's the new stuff God's doing. The Old Testament, old, oh, just stay back there. And what happened to me is that Amos and Acts just had this collision where they dovetailed together. And we see this prophetic picture that God has been preparing for generations for us to experience. We're really part of this. My message titled is Time to Build Legacy. I'm thinking about what is going to remain, who are we going to become, and what really matters to us. I believe our legacy is the presence of the Lord. I believe the legacy of Big House has nothing to do with me or Adam and has everything to do about what Jesus wants to do on earth as it is in heaven. And my legacy as a pastor is to help usher in the presence of the Lord in your life, in your family's life, in our city, and in the nation, and in the world. I believe this message and what we're about as a community is so vital and so important. Amos 9. So Amos 9, in the first half, it's this classic Israel has rebelled, and God's coming with judgment, and it's all the bad things if you don't turn, and then it's Jesus reveals, God reveals, this is what I want to do, and this is the restoration that I'm planning and I'm preparing. Verse 11, it says, in that day, I will restore David's fallen shelter. We're going to break down what that practically was. He says, I will repair its broken walls and restore its ruins and will rebuild it as it used to be, so that they may possess the remnant. Some Bibles say Edom. Uh, that really is defined as mankind, so that they will possess the remnant of mankind. And all the nations that bear my name, declares the Lord, who will do these things. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when the reaper will overtake, be overtaken by the plowman and the planter by the one treading grapes. Let's pause right there. What does that mean? The reaper will be overtaken by the plowman. That means there's going to be so much harvest. The person reaping the harvest 
is still going to be out there when the plowman's like, hey, dude, get out of the way. I need, to, I need to plant seed. And he's like, no, there's still harvest. It's still sprouting. It's still growing. The harvest keeps coming. Can I tell you, that's the season that we're in right now. You might say, I love big house. It's just, it's intimate. And it's, it's just, let's just keep it this crew. Can I tell you? No, we are going to grow. We are going to multiply. The harvest is going to keep coming in. If there's a bigger container, God's going to keep filling it. Amen. Let it be under the Lord. That's what's going to happen. The lame are going to come in. The lost are going to be found. Redemption's going to come. Healing's going to come. Imagine you plant a tomato plant in June, and you're expecting June, July, maybe August, and then it's going to pitter out and it's going to die. September comes. New, big, luscious tomatoes. September, still, they keep coming. October, they're still coming. November, December, January, you want to plant them again, but the ones you had there, they just keep blooming and sprouting. That's the season that we're walking into. The reaper will be overtaken by the plowman and the planter by the by the one treading grapes. New wine will drip from the mountains and flow from all the hills. And I will bring my people Israel back from exile. They will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will plant vineyards and drink their wine and they will make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant Israel in their own land, never again to be uprooted from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. This was prophesied over Adam. He shared the story a few weeks ago, I think at Mount Trashmore. The prophet looked at him and he said, Amos 9-11, Amos 9-11, hearkening back to, to Acts 15. Adam didn't even know what Amos 9-11 was. But God began speaking this, rebuilding David's fallen shelter. He didn't know Adam was a worship leader, passionate about being on the hillside type of worship, spontaneously hearing the heart of God and, and, and poetically declaring those things. It's funny, Adam... We had this, uh, this nickname for him. It was Renaissance Man. Like he just does, you know, it does all the things. You know what I mean? And we did, a, we did music together um, when I was 21. We recorded Adam, Adam's second album. I actually have a degree in music technology too. And so that's part of what connected all of us and a lot of us on the, on the staff is through worship. Uh, but we went to this church and they had this fire tunnel and this prophetic, prophetic night. And uh, I've shared this story before. I walked through with my like, arms up, and somebody's like, you don't, have to, you don't have to have your hands up through the fire tunnel. I was like, I know. I'm just receiving from the Lord. It's okay. I just wanted to walk through. And Adam walks through, and somebody points at him and goes, Renaissance man. It's just this, this prophetic picture that God is doing something in Adam. And I've just seen God just prophetically begin to clarify things in Adam's life and I'm grateful we get to be the benefit of a community of all the prophetic words that God's speaking to you, to Adam, and to all of us. They're all intersecting together in this time because God is up to something really powerful, really special. You are his legacy, and his presence is the thing that we want to spend our life focusing on. So I want to read this section from a book called Enthroned by a guy named David Fritch. You guys remember David Fritch? He's in our community for many years. They moved to... Chicago to be near Heather's family, and he wrote a book on this, this, this topic of David's David's tent. And I, I know I shouldn't do this. It's 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 not recommended as a speaker to read eight paragraphs. But I believe these are so important and vital to who we are as a community and what the Lord's been speaking to me. I want to read these over 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 us today. Can you guys handle that? Can you stay with me, okay? Nudge your nudge your uh, your partner next to you. Say, stay, stay focused. You ready? A sound from the hidden places. Reformers find their cause in the midst of the darkest moral and spiritual climates. Spiritual poverty creates the necessary conditions to provoke hope-filled dreamers to leave the status quo and courageously build a better tomorrow. Right in the midst of a nation being ripped to shreds by rogue powers and principalities, a new sound was being forged in the heart of a young shepherd boy on the hillside of Judah. In the underground, far removed from power-hungry politicians and greedy priests, David fell in love with his God. This, his simple songs of love and hunger for God were counterculture to the core. As the nation grew colder and colder towards God, the fire of David's passion for God intensified. 
In his unwavering pursuit of God, he both resisted the spiritual indifference of his pe people and caught the attention of heaven. This was the kind of man God wanted for king, hungry and humble. There was a stark contrast between the heart of David and the heart of Saul. Saul may have thought he rejected God, but in the end, God rejected him and chose a man after his own heart. David's love for God ripped through 40 years of rebellion and compelled him to establish a new and holy order in Israel. David didn't just become the next king. He became the architect of the very kingdom of God on earth. In America, what a president chooses as his first political move is often the most important. The first move defines and can make or break an administration. Much thought is given to these initial decisions because they have the potential to inspire confidence and create positive forward momentum throughout a president's tenure. David's first act as king was revolutionary and must have shocked all who looked on. I can imagine him sitting around the boardroom with his advisors discussing what their first move would be. Now, Jerry broke this down a little bit in his prophetic word earlier, but all the tribes of Israel were separated and there was infighting going on. Saul had not ran Israel very well and had passed away. It's another life message that I have. David went through all of these trials to be prepared to be king. And he, when he got there, realized I don't want to be king. Jesus, I want you to be king. And you see his whole tenure as king was not how he could elevate himself, but how he could elevate God. And in this really terrible moment, in 2 Samuel, David's life falls to the lowest of lows. All He's with a bunch of guys in the cave of Adullam, all these outcasts, and all their women and children have been stolen. They're in this really difficult place, and he hears his best friends whispering, maybe we should just stone David. He's in his lowest of low. Can I tell you this? Even in your lowest of lows, God is using and preparing you for what's next. He's purifying us, preparing us. And it was at that moment, there's this little line, says, David strengthened himself in the Lord. He couldn't look to anyone else to solve his problems. He realized it's you and it's only you. And after years and years of running and hiddenness, right after that, you see the, the chapter turn. Saul dies in battle and David moves into his place as king. And then we get to see this moment here. What will David do? What is his strategy? David's first act was, as king was revolutionary and must have shocked all who looked on. I can imagine him sitting at the boardroom with his advisors discussing what their first move would be. One may have said, we should invest in and expand our military. We must secure our borders. Who wouldn't have agreed with that kind of practical wisdom? Another may have suggested, we should review and reform our economic policies. Who would want greater economic stability and an increase of prosperity? All these ideas would have been logical and extremely practical. But David knew it would take more than logic to incite a revolution. It would take a God-sized dream. David knew he could not turn the hearts of a cold-hearted people back to God with spreadsheets and a five-year plan. His first move was neither logical or practical in any sense, but it was explosive with passion. And passion often looks crazy to an apathetic culture. I can imagine the eager anticipation in the room and the jaws that dropped when David finally revealed his master plan. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to get God in our midst again. We're going to rescue the Ark of the Covenant from the wilderness. Put it under a tent without a veil right next to our headquarters on Mount Zion. We're going to hire 4,288 full-time singers and musicians to worship the Lord 24 hours a day. And by the way, it's going to cost $1 billion. Silence, shock, questioning, more questioning. Wait, we're going to do what? This is the strategy? But why? David's decision wasn't born of youthful zeal, but from a deep well of love for God that had been tested and tried through decades of hardship and persecution. 
He led from the wisdom of heaven and with the spirit of prophecy. David inaugurated one of the greatest reformations of all time. He reversed every decision and dismantled every system that had sprung up from the ungodly soil of Saul's heart and set Israel back on the foundation of the kingdom of heaven. David's leadership style was the exact opposite of King Saul. David brought the people of God into his presence again. We're going to get God in our midst again. I have, I have an interesting position in my, in my role here at Big House, and, and, I, and I love it. And a, and a lot of people that are new to Big House will come for a couple weeks, and they'll say, hey, I love what's going on at Big House, but we should do this, and we should do this, and we should do this, and we should do this. And all those things I love, and they're good. And we might do those things. I say this all the time, yes, but not yet. We want to do that. We're going to do that. We're just not yet. But then there's times when we say, that's a great idea, but what we're going to do is we're going to get God in the midst of us again. We're not going to do 20 minutes of worship. We're going to let worship flow for over an hour, almost every single week. And we're going to get God in our presence again. We're going to find a way to worship as often as possible together. I look forward at the plans of God for us in our community, and I see I see us worshiping as often as we can do. We want to do morning, noon, and night, and we want to do more if we can do that. But it's going to take more and more people that say, I will be there. I will show up Monday morning. I will lead this prayer set. I will, I will be on the prayer team. If we can minister to the heart of, of the Lord, we're going to see dramatic things change. See, Jesus was the manifestation of the temple in the New Testament. He's the temple in human form with two legs. He's, 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 we have someone on the Trinity with flesh on that knows us, was familiar with us. He came as a man for us. John 1, 14 says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Uh, I'm going to say it wrong. Skeniu is the Greek word for dwelling there. Skenou. Somebody, anybody know it? Okay, good. Any Greek <laughs> scholars out here? I welcome your feedback. So the word became flesh and made his what? His tabernacle among us, his tent among us. He will restore David's fallen tent. He is with us. See, we didn't, God didn't say, hey, everyone get saved. We're all going to meet in the middle of North America. We're going to create this, this big place, and that's where I'm going to meet you. See, that was the Old Testament formula. Build a tabernacle, put the ark there, and God will come, and we will be in his presence. What's the New Testament model? We are all living stones. We're two or more are gathered. He is there with us. God is meeting with thousands upon thousands of churches all across the nation right here, right now, in the midst of us, meeting us, healing us, restoring us. His plan of redemption is so massive. He's restoring David's fallen tent, the place of intimacy. I love this definition. Uh, to pitch a tent or live in a tent, denoting much more than the, more, the mere general notion of dwelling. In dwelling in intimate communion with the resurrected Christ, even as he himself lived in unbroken communion with the Father during the final days of his flesh. Wherever you lift up the name of Jesus, he dwells there with us. He establishes his tent. Zeal for the house consumed Jesus. You know, when he, when he, I'm just getting like, like my paradigm is just shifting. And you know, I see Jesus like getting all the, all the people selling things in the temple and tax collectors, and all these things out of here. And he says, hey, my house will be a house of prayer. And we really focus on that one moment. But then after that, we see Jesus healing the lame. Inviting in the broken. I think he realized, I just, I want to get back to this place of intimacy where my temple, where people can meet with me, where it's not different levels and you got to get through these gates and, and finally, you know, people holding people back from my presence. He tore the veil so that we could be with him in intimacy. Zeal for the house consumed him. So now we fast forward to the book of Acts. Acts 15 uh, shares this moment in the early church where the Gentiles, people who were not Jewish, were now uh, 
receiving Jesus. And so the Jews at that time were saying, hey, but you need, you need to follow our rules. You need to be circumcised, and you need to go through all of these laws and all these rules. And basically the early church fathers were having this big debate on should that happen or not. And what we see is that Amos 9 intersects with Acts 15, and we see that God has prophetically been weaving this plan of redemption for all of us. This is a plan that God's drawing us into even right now as a church community to restore David's fallen tent, to create a place where people can come and meet with the Lord and be changed and be renewed. I'm going to jump to um, verse 6 of chapter of Acts chapter 15. The apostles and the elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God knows the heart. God who knows the heart showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. The whole assembly became silent and listened to Paul and Barnabas, telling about the signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. When they finished, James spoke up. Brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. The words of the prophet are in agreement with this, as it is written. After this, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild, and I will restore it, that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things. That was mind-blowing for that time, that the people of Israel would, that Jesus would allow non-Israelites to be a part of that. Aren't you so grateful that we can be invited in? And we don't have to follow a bunch of rules. He just says, I have paid for you with my blood, and I'm inviting you into intimacy. What we're building is a place where people can come and meet with God. Week after week, we meet in this place. We prioritize the presence of God, and he begins to, he begins to take care of our needs. I, remember, I love this story. I, I met a mo woman in the lobby, and she said, hey, I'm going through something difficult, and um, do, you, do you have a list of counselors that you might recommend? And I do. So if you guys need that, let me know. I also see a counselor, and it's one of the most beneficial things I've done. Um, and so we just began to process, and she's in church today, that day, and worship was like custom built for her. It was like deep healing, the things she was going through. It was like every prophetic word. I was just like, I almost like wanted to tell her. I didn't tell anybody. <laughs> like, this isn't planned, you know? <laughs> and she came down to the front, and, and she wasn't crying. She was travailing and weeping. Yeah, wow. And she met God in that moment. Yeah. And she came back to me, and she said, I'm so embarrassed. I'm so sorry. I was being so loud. I just like, I was so out of order. And I just, and I said, that was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. What a counselor couldn't fix, what a 12-step program couldn't fix, the presence of God 30 minutes later was like, I'm going to meet you in your place of need. That is the power of Jesus. That's, that's what we're after as a community, to create an atmosphere where people can meet with God. That's, that's restoring David's fall intent. The best legacy is when we point people to Jesus. Legacy understands it's not about you. I'd be totally fine if no one remembers my name, but they remember how much I love Jesus. 
and that if anything that I say or do pointed you back to Jesus and you forgot all about me, praise be to the Lord. What I want to give my life to is building a place where people can meet with Jesus. I, I'm so passionate about it. I think out of this, out of this community is going to be hundreds of pastors, hundreds of missionaries, hundreds of faithful young people, marriages they are going to be strong and be restored. There is just no limit to what God will do when we invite his presence into the midst of us. He will do exceedingly more than we could ask or imagine. Pray and believe, and God will do incredible things. You know, I've been processing um, this really specific season that we're in to build. You know, my prayer has been this, Lord, don't just make it about a building plan and needing to raise funds. I, I believe this is a season God is bringing us in as a community to upgrade us in our faith, to believe what we can't see, and our generosity to give and to see that God wants to actually pour through us an incredible amount of resources to fuel his kingdom. I believe that he's wanting to prepare us for ministry. There are ministries that have not materialized yet, that, that you are built to serve in, that God is creating space for. I just fully believe it. Some of you are waiting in the wings, but guess what? There's going to be a harvest coming in, and you're going to be desperately needed to do what you do best, what God has gifted you to do. It's so important. There's going to be sacrifice to get this done. I want you guys to be able to drive by this building in 30 years and say, I helped get that thing built. I helped do this. I can't wait to walk into every room and say, touch a little drywall and be like, I was part of this. I helped this, mater I helped this dream materialize. Christy and I have, we've got five kids. Um, my in-laws live with us. Cassidy lives with us, basically adopted a daughter. There's 10 people in my house. Um, basically a, a, a you know, single income family. I think if anybody had maybe a little bit of an excuse to be like, I don't really have any extra to make this work, <laughs> I might be able to make that list, right? But I just, Chris and I were just talking, just how can we give above and beyond? What can we do to sacrifice? I've got a, um, I've got a, a, a little luxury in my life. So I have a motorcycle. And I was talking to Christy, and I just was like, I just, I think, I think the Lord's asking me to give this, but it's, but I don't want to. <laughs> and I was thinking, that, that's good. It makes it a sacrificial gift unto the Lord. God might ask you to give something that, that might be, might be tough and challenging, but can I tell you, building the kingdom pales into comparison to any materialistic thing that I own. Everything that I have is the Lord's. How can I ask you to sacrifice if I'm not willing to sacrifice? We're, we're, we're asking you guys in the next couple weeks to think and pray about a courageous gift, giving your biggest and best gift to the Lord. That's going to help fuel us into the start of this building project. And then the, the, the next ask we're giving is a consistent gift. Is there something that you can give consistently above and beyond monthly over the next 24 months to help us reach our goal and to get to that finish line? And the last gift, like, that mo like my motorcycle, is a creative gift. Is there something that you have that you can say, you know what? There's some value here, and I, and I want to I give this to the kingdom. I want to see this fuel that kid's wing, see that sanctuary get built. I want to buy a few chairs in that sanctuary, you know? <laughs> Maybe you want to get a part of the sound system. You get to choose, you know? It's all going to the same place, but um, I just I have full faith. God's going to do it. He's going to provide. But I want to encourage you as a pastor, don't miss an opportunity to be a part of it. Yeah. Find something that, that you can give. It's not... It's not equal giving, it's equal sacrifice. Um, and listen, there's no coercion in this at all. As the Holy Spirit speaking, have joy. Be a hilarious giver. Be generous and cheerful when you do it. Don't feel any, any pressure. So as I close, I, I, wanna, I wanna just look a little bit at this, this tent. 4,000 4, worshipers created teams. They, they had 24 different teams mirroring the 24 elders. There was, 
it was not just all spontaneous. There was order and there were probably spreadsheets back in the day on scrolls, getting these worship teams figured out. But there was, there was, there was just beautiful activity taking place at this tent. A good chunk of the Psalms get traced back to this prayer tent. Think about that, this 30 year period of time. Psalms were written there that Jesus used to teach his disciples how to pray. The songs that the Israelites prayed by, songs that modern evangelicals, songwriters, reach back to and draw from and write melodies to, were recorded by scribe, scribes crouched in corners of the temple, scribbling out the prayers of the people in their journals. A number of the Messianic prophecies the words that reveal Jesus as the promised Son of God are traced back to this prayer tent. This is not a nonstop worship service with a bunch of spiritual hype or well wishing and empty promises, with well wishing and empty promises. These were people that were unfolding the redemption plan of God. I love that. Jesus would quote the Psalms more than any other Old Testament book as an explanation for who he was and what his ministry would be. The prayers of David became the formula for recognizing Jesus. The nation watched as the most prolific leader of their time enjoyed the presence of God. First in a dramatic spectacle. Remember as the ark came in, he danced unashamed. There's a lot of depth to the decision he made, but he wore an, an ephod. And the best way I can explain this is that the priestly robes were these beautiful ornate robes. And then as you get down to people serving in the in the in the temple, they kind of like the, the lower level guys wore these ephods. So David was saying to his people, I'm not wearing the kingly robes and I'm not wearing the priestly robes. It's like he said, I'm gonna put on the maintenance outfit for for the temple. And I'm gonna worship the Lord in humility and wonder and awe. And he was so joyful. As the Ark of the Covenant came back in, he was restoring the presence of the Lord to Israel. Not only that, they saw David sustain the rhythm of worship for over three decades. Think about how that will shape your life, your kid's life, our city, and our nation. What we are doing right now is so paramount and important. We're putting our tent pegs in the ground and saying, Jesus, come meet with us so that the remnant can come in and worship, so people can experience you in your fullness. If I had more time, I'd unpack it, but, but they don't, it doesn't speak of anything in David's tent where there was multiple levels and layers before you could get to the Holy of Holies. I think it was just set right in the middle, and they just got the pure, unadulterated power and presence of God. Today I was just experiencing that in God's presence. Lord, just to be with you completely unveiled in your presence, nothing holding us back. What happens if we begin to continue to press in and engage the presence of God? He's going to speak to us and unfold plans for us we couldn't even imagine. This makes what David did all the more powerful. Through night and day worship and prayer, David established a place of continual agreement with the will of God in the earth. David knew they weren't just singing songs, but they were building a throne and habitation for the king of kings to rule the land again. As they sang, God fought for us. As they cast down their crowns, God took up his. And as, the, as they bowed down, God rose victorious over all their enemies. Can I hear an amen? amen? Let's stand together. It's time to build a legacy, friends. This isn't Adam's thing, it's not my thing, it's not a big house staff thing, this is our thing. Your worship and your prayers are powerful and effective. Did you know that? Powerful things take place when we worship every single Sunday. I have, I have experienced so much breakthrough in the past five years here at Big House. It's just unbelievable. He's taking us from glory to glory. So whether you're a brand new Christian, you've been walking with the Lord for 30 years, God has something for us, and he's calling us deeper into his presence. Let's pray. Lord, help us restore David's fallen tent. 
in us and through us. Jesus, we welcome you. We welcome you. We thank you that you removed every single obstacle to being in your presence. You tore the veil so we could come boldly to the throne of grace in our time of need. Would you raise up worshipers that worship you in spirit and in truth, Lord? Would you raise up worshipers that help restore David's fallen tent that the king of glory may come in? Lord, I thank you for what you've been doing prophetically, weaving all of these pictures, speaking to Adam Cates and and in the 20th century, hearkening back to Amos 9-11, to Acts 15, to even now, we see what you're doing, Lord, and we say yes. We say amen. We say let it be done through us and in us with the, your help, Lord. We say, Lord, help us build, Lord. I thank you, Lord God, that we will be able to create a place where you can habitate, Lord. Lord, we don't just ask for just a visitation. We ask for a habitation, Lord. Lord, I'm desperate for my kids and grandkids to receive a touch from you, Lord. My great-grandkids, that they would know you and love you and honor you, Lord. Thank you for the legacy you're building through us. Lord, we thank you that this is a time to build. There is many seasons of waiting, Lord, but we say now we see it. It's time to build right now, and we are ready. Lord, help us to walk in and sacrifice to help build what you're doing, Jesus. Lord, we just say that we love you. And we thank you. Build your kingdom in us. In Jesus' name, amen.